This lecture touches on a number of interesting subjects regarding the structure of materials. For starters, uh, silicate ceramics. Now this is becoming more and more important as silicon wafers and integrated circuits become more and more part of our lives and become a more important source for economic growth. Now in the earth, specifically the lithosphere uh, where we have all of our solids, the most common elements are silicon and oxygen. So uh, silicate ceramics are very easy to uh, produce from a material point of view, although in order to make them into a very large crystal such as those needed for integrated circuits, it does take a lot of time and effort and energy. But the materials themselves are quite cheap, silicon and oxygen. Well, silica, SiO2, is very common. It can be found very in, in many sands in uh, the world. There are many different types of sand, but the most common is uh, SiO2 or silica. But it can be found in quartz and the cristobalite and the tritomite. And these are polymorphic forms. Poly meaning many, morphic meaning shape. So it's the same thing in different shapes. There are very strong bonds here, and that leads to a high melting temperature. Silicates are complex. This complexity comes from the ability of silicon to accept four electrons to bond with. So it can have up to four sites of bonding, as you see here. Now, um, this four negative comes from the fact that oxygen accepts two electrons into its structure so that it can be um, stable. And if I've got four of them, four times two is eight. Well, the silicon gave up four so now it's still in a, a four negative state. So um, we have additional places to bond, one on each of these oxygens. So this then can then bond with another silicon and we can make these large structures. So when we put additional cations in, that means we can uh, maintain the charge neutrality and we can have additional bonding and change the properties as needed. Glass is an interesting structure. It is primarily uh, quartz, depending on the type of glass, but what we're considering right now is uh, crystalline SiO2 and you've seen quartz probably in a, a rock or a stone. Um, the, the white part came, may be coming out of the granite and it has a very nice regular structure like this which is why you see uh, more of a crystalline looking object from a macro scale. We can make soda glass which is a very common cheap glass out of silicon dioxide and it is in an amorphous shape. Notice very carefully that most of these bonds are still the normal um, tetrahedron type bond. This of course is in a 2D. But we put in some sodium ions that keep the charge neutral and we can make glass out of this. Now, there's also something called layered silicates, another complex form where you have uh, some silicon layers and then you have some other, say, uh, aluminum layer and they are connected through oxygen and hydrogen layers. And um, as always, the negative charge has to be balanced by the positive charge. So to give you a better example of this, we'll look at this 
structure. Here we have aluminum with a bunch of hydroxies up here and then we've got silicon down here these blue ones and they're connected to the oxygens just like the previous uh, tetrahedral structures that we saw before in the previous section but then one layer of those oxygens is kind of all together down at the bottom and then the other layer are mixed with these hydroxy anions and then we have a bunch of the aluminums so these different planes that would normally have similar charges are shielded from each other by these different layers now um, these sheets these end up being um, two-dimensional essentially two-dimensional sheets and uh, they are loosely bound to each other by the secondary forces but if you've ever felt uh, clay and felt it in your hands it can be very smooth and lubricious and that's because of the nano structures that are on this level and we mentioned the word polymorphism earlier and again it means many shapes it means two or more crystal structures for the same material so it could be titanium which comes in uh, an alpha or beta forms that's how we distinguish between the two different types we call them by various Greek letters alpha and beta and carbon can be polymorphic as well so for example diamond and graphite and in iron uh, just depending on the temperature uh, under 912 C it's alpha between 912 and 1394 it's gamma and between 1394 and 1538 C it is delta iron and beyond that it's liquid the type of crystal system changes here and even this BC is a little different than this one because of, of the temperatures and some other possibilities with the structures so you can have the same material straight up iron or straight up titanium or straight up carbon in multiple shapes depending on processing or temperature uh, or other factors so we mentioned carbon you'll notice here's here's diamond the hardest material that we know and if you notice that it looks like a face centered cubic structure but then it has these additional internal uh, tetrahedral atoms in between all of these uh, corners and faces and that makes it a tetrahedral so if you see this one this one this one this one this one and this one this is kind of internal it's in between this face this face this face and this corner and we have essentially four of those uh, tetrahedrons within this cube and it is extremely stable extremely hard and it's not even a metal good question is why does it have high thermal conductivity well if you think about it a uh, um, heat is about vibration about uh, molecular vibration and if something is very hard and does not bend much it will um, tend to vibrate very easily whereas if you have a uh, say a piece of rubber that's very flexible then and you try to make waves with it it will dampen the waves and on a uh, micro or nano scale that's what happens to it uh, has it just transmits that energy straight through it because it's such a um, such a rigid structure so uh, large ones will be in gemstones uh, but small crystals are used a lot in grinding and uh, the cutting of other materials in fact we can make thin films from diamond as well there are many uh, attempts today to develop diamonds in the lab and um, 
because of the interests in keeping diamonds extremely expensive. There are only a few or a couple of companies that actually own diamond mines and they keep the prices artificially high. Diamonds are actually fairly common in nature but there's only a few uh, major mines and so they keep the prices artificially high and in fact uh, it can be almost dangerous to develop the um, uh, technology to make diamonds because it can be uh, a threat to very large corporations. Well here's carbon again and let's look at this carbon atom right here. It is securely bonded to its three nearest neighbors but it has a light bond actually to its neighbor up above and its neighbor down below. So this kind of carbon structure, graphite, comes in sheets and it can be very lubricious and very weak compared to the other form of pure carbon that we just looked at in the diamond. I've used graphite on uh, various projects that uh, require uh, a very simple and safe lubricant. Some more recent technology include fullerenes and nanotubes and these are all made of carbons but these are tubes that are only a few nanometers in diameter or balls that are in a uh, few nanometers in diameter and they're very strong but they can also uh, conduct electricity very very well with very low or negligible resistance and that makes them very useful and there's they're developing new uses for these uh, nanotubes and fullerenes every day crystals can be used in a variety of forms you can have single crystals such as diamonds used for abrasives they even use a single crystal for turbine blades nearby they actually have uh, and develop these turbine blades in single crystal form in a uh, production factory that we hopefully will have a tour on sometime this semester. The reason why single crystals can be a big plus is that in these turbine blades they can give you certain strength in certain directions so if you grow them they can give you greater strength in that direction. Also as we'll learn later, these may fracture along crystal boundaries. So if you have no crystal boundaries, you just have one crystal, then you don't have that method of failure. Now quartz can fracture more easily along some crystal planes than others, so it really helps to know what direction you are dealing with within a uh, crystal structure and how you can best use those to your advantage. We will discuss these directions in the next lecture. Polycrystals made of many crystals are what's much more common. So pretty much anything that you normally use in uh, say a car engine or anything that's cast or anything that's machined, um, you'll basically assume that it's made out of a polycrystal. Now this is a uh, picture of a weld and you'll notice that some of these crystals have directions and some of them are just small bits. The ones that have direction actually end up being anisotropic. Anisotropic means not the same in all directions whereas isotropic means pretty much the same in directions. So this each grain here is a crystal and if these are all randomly oriented then the bulk properties end up being non-directional the same or the same in all directions so it won't matter what direction but these crystals are not the same 
in all directions. So it, depending on your processing, again, you might end up making an assumption that everything's the same in all directions, but if you didn't process it that way, it might not be, and your assumption might not be correct. And grain sizes for different materials can range from, again, just a nanometer to um, nearly an inch. So that's a very large. Single crystals can vary with direction because the distance from here to here is different than the distance from here to here. So these two are closer than these two. So this direction along this arrow is going to have a different set of properties than the direction along this arrow. And that's true. If you can measure the modulus of elasticity along the edge, it's 125 gigapascals, and along the diagonal, it's 273 gigapascals, which makes a lot of sense because these are right in line with each other. Here, there's more space. Even in polycrystals, some properties may not vary with direction. If you have a sample like this, they're pretty much the same size, more or less circular. But if you are processing them in a way that stretches them, whether it's an extrusion or a rolling, then you might end up with di more, much more directionality. And you'll have to account for that in your design. In this lecture, we covered a couple of interesting materials, specifically silicon materials and carbon materials. Just touched on a couple of different types of polymorphic versions of them and what happens when they are uh, combined with different structures and different uh, other elements. And we focused again on polymorphism things that are the same uh, material but different internal structures and how that affects them. Next we will cover uh, directions within the crystals themselves and how that can affect their properties.